All right. So I, I'm Ben Clark. I am the archivist and historian here at the Marathon County Historical Society. And um, last year, around November, October, somewhere in there, um, I was sitting down with Cheryl Del Conte, who is our events coordinator, and we were figuring out what is the um, History Speaks lecture series going to look like. And we were trying to figure out, okay, who, you know, who is, who should we talk to, who might be wanting to present, who should we, what kind of topics would we like to see here? And I thought, you know, WASA is celebrating 150 years in 2022. And so with the ongoing celebrations, it felt like somebody ought to talk about it. And I thought, hmm, by this point, I was already starting to, to think, how would I do this? And when it came down to it, I said, well, I'll take a crack at it, because I'd like to do these programmer once in a while. Now, around this time, um, we needed a, a title, something to just, you know, put on a schedule, you know, it doesn't have to be permanent, but, and I was at the time looking through some sources from the 1800s about, you know, what the, um, what, what Wisconsin historians were talking about WASA. And I came across a quote that said, uh, among other things, I was like, oh, perfect, this is, this is a good explanation. I scribbled it in the notes of my, the margins of my uh, notebook. And it said that WASA was conscious of a brilliant future. And there's, there's more to it. And I was like, oh, this is a really interesting way to think about this. And so I, I there's the title. Um, so conscious of a brilliant future, cool. And I thought, you know, I'm never gonna, I'll remember where this came from. And I wrote it down. I wouldn't lose that. I, I lost that sheet of paper. So consequently, over the next few months, every once in a while, I would sit down and try to figure out, okay, what quote was that from? I knew it was from a book from the 1800s. And so look, and no, nothing there. And about two weeks ago, I found it. Ooh. So the full quote, as I had written it down, was that Wassa was a typical lumbering town, conscious of a brilliant future and alive with the bustle of the world, which is, it's pretty good writing, I gotta say. So, the city of Wassa, and, and I was like, oh great, I, not even that, I also wrote, <laughs> good on me, I wrote the citation, who wrote this? It was Ruben Goldthwaites, who you may not have heard of, but he is one of the formative historians for Wisconsin. For a long time, he kind of oversaw the State Historical Society as the secretary. He's one of the big giants in the history, uh, the history of, of Wisconsin. And in 1899, he wrote this book, The Story of Wisconsin, and there, lo and behold. So I was like, oh, great. And I went and grabbed the book and figured out, here's where, this, here's where it was. And it turns out that it was not exactly as I had written it down. I'd forgotten about this part. Merrill, Wassa, Stevens Point, Chippewa Falls, and Hudson are typical lumbering towns, each conscious of a brilliant future and alive with the bustle of the world. Which is a little disappointing, I gotta say. This is the only sentence in the entire page, and you can see there's more than 400 pages in the entire book. Only once does he use the word Wassa or refer to Marathon County, and it's in the context of all of these other cities. And initially I was like, ah, that's unfortunate. But you know, it kind of makes sense. I came around because it actually is kind of typical of a lot of state historians, especially from this period. Wassa, they don't get up here very often. A lot of times it's a, it's a footnote, they'll mention us in passing, which I, I say kind of in part because I am a little um, frustrated sometimes when I crack open a book, I'm like, oh, what, what do they talk about here? And you know, they don't really talk about us. Unless you're talking about polka or farming, and then they talk about Wassa. Um, and others too. But the point is here, it, it, it's, it's a little, I'm, I'm, I'm playing it up a little bit for, for, for that aspect of it, but actually it's a good reminder. Um, a, not only is it, oh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for us to tell our own stories. We can't wait for Reuben Goldthwaite to have come up here and documented the history because he didn't do that. And that's fair, you know, he can't talk about every single city. It's also a good opportunity because it turns out that this is a great opportunity, you know, it's still good writing. This, even though it also applies to Merrill and Chippewa Falls, it still applies to Wassa. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna look at this quote and more or less use this as the framework. How did Wassa emerge as a typical lumber town? How were we conscious of a brilliant future that we saw ahead of us, not just that we had potential, but that we knew we had potential. We were gonna make it happen. And how were we alive with the bustle of the world? which itself is kind of a weird statement. What does it actually mean? Well, it can mean a bunch of different things and we'll see some of that. I'm gonna start though with a map. Well, actually two maps. I like maps. This is probably the first map ever of what is going to become Wassa. It was drawn by this man here, George Stevens, who you might've heard of. Back in the 1839, he had come up 
as the first, uh, so okay, let's step back a little bit. Back in 1837, he had been down in St. Louis, which was the center of lumbering at that point in time. And he had heard, you know, he spent a year, he's a New Yorker, he spent years, you know, taking logs down the Allegheny and the Ohio rivers. And he was in rough, you know, he was in his late 40s at this point, he wasn't in the best of health. His finances were on the brink of ruin. But he hears this guy talking very enthusiastically about up in Wisconsin, they got this Wisconsin river and the pinery up there and all the potential. And he goes, you know, let me go take a look. So he comes up in 1838, maybe with uh, Robert Wakeley, who was the person who was talking to him. Uh, some accounts say he was there, some accounts say it was by himself except for his dog. So it's just him and his dog in the canoe going up the Wisconsin river when nobody, no white people lived there. It was just you know, a handful of Native Americans that he might have passed, but that was probably not it. And he sees for himself the potential, the great extent of the pinery in this area and the power of the Wisconsin River. And he says, okay, yeah, there's some potential here. And so this map, uh, there's a little contrast that you can see here that I added. This is what he draws the following year. He has come back with a group of uh, men that he hires and they set up the first buildings and mills in what is going to become Wausau. It's actually at the location here, this is uh, the Big Bull Falls. That's the point on the river. There was no Wassa yet. We're, we're not quite that far. Um, but Big Bull Falls, this point on the river named because of, well, some French Canadians named it that. We don't exactly know where that came from. There's a lot of different stories. But the point is, the water power is why he settled here. So the water power is one reason we're here. Here's another map. This is based off of a treaties land map with the Native Americans. Back in 1836, Wisconsin became a territory. You know, it's the, one of the last vestiges of the Northwest Territory that we had won from the, the British back in the War of 1812. And even though if you look at maps at that period, you will see the Wisconsin Territory being not only what we have of Wisconsin and also most of, of Minnesota, that doesn't account for the Ho-Chunk and the Chippewa and the Dakota and the Menominee because they were here first and they didn't agree to any sort of American claims. So Charles Dodge, who's the first governor, he has the unenviable goal of let's make sure that we figure out who owns what so we can negotiate with them. This is all happening in the aftermath of the Black Hawk War, which is this brutal, bloody war between the United States and the Sioux and a number of other people in the southeast in Iowa and southern, or southwest Wisconsin. Um, and it all basically happened because some um, uh, American explorers went out and they, they started settling on disputed lands. We didn't do that due process. So they don't, they, they don't want to make sure that that happens again for the, from this perspective of the territory, but they also want to make sure that people like George Stevens, who's there, they're putting a lot of money into this venture to come up here in a few years. They want to make sure that they're not going to be attacked by the Native Americans, at least in theory. So anyway, Charles Dodge, he sits down with the Native Americans and he kind of figures out roughly, this is not actually accurate of where they lived. You know, in, in what is Mao Marathon County, there were Ho-Chunk, there were Chippewa, there were Menominee, although this makes it seem like it's mostly Chippewa. But this is the, the, basically the map that was used to then try to figure out how to negotiate. And so in, later in 1836, we negotiate, the United States signs an agreement with the chiefs of the Menominee tribes, and it's called the Treaty of the Cedars. And as you can see, the purple bits on the eastern edge, that's mostly what that is, the cedar lands. However, there is this bit of the Wisconsin River that goes up there, that little purple bit in the middle of the state. And I love this map because it shows very clearly why they want the area. That is not a tract of land that's going to be there for farming. That's there because of the power of the Wisconsin River and the fact that there's trees to cut down. You're not going to drag, um, basically it is three miles on each side of the Wisconsin River. You're not going to drag a log five, six, seven miles to the water because that's the only way to get the logs out of the pinery. So that's what they want. And of course, the, the Chippewa are also probably more common here. So the following year, um, we see another agreement here with the Chippewa, the Dakota, and the Ho-Chunk for a great, more chunks of that land here. Um, the one with the Chippewa is called the Treaty of St. Peter, I believe. Although in the United States, they often call it the Treaty of the Pines. So again, you can see the, the intention there. So let's talk about the logging industry and how it emerges. Because it is the, the king, it is the famous industry here. George Stevens comes up, a handful of other people in the 1840s are going to take over, working in the lumber mills as well as running them. And the pattern that, that, that continues, and I, it's worth taking some time to talk about this because it's really important for the development in the 1800s. So like I said, 
pine is what's important. There's a lot of other trees that exist out here in the Northwoods. There's a lot of, uh, particularly hemlock, but there's also maple and oak and walnut and, well, the problem with those trees is if you put them in the water, they're gonna, because they're denser, they're gonna soak up more water and they're gonna sink. Pine, if you put it on the river, it's gonna float a lot longer so we can get it out of the Wisconsin River. So what you do is in the winter, you go out into the pinery. You cut down as many of the pines as you can um, and, and at this point, they're being selective because they don't want to make sure that they get the right trees. And then you drag them. They're doing it in winter so that you can drag them on a sleigh to the riverbed, right? It's going to be harder to do that in the spring when everything is mud, right? But of course, once they get there, the water is frozen. So they're going to stack those logs waiting for the thaw. And in the spring, when the water does thaw, when the, uh, the ice melts, and particularly the snow and the ice upriver then join, all that water then joins the Wisconsin River or whatever river you're on and the water level rises, um, it's gonna be a lot easier to then dump these into the water and float them down the river, which is what happened next, happens next. So the logs then get floated down this, to the sawmill. Um, there would be a group of men who would be responsible for this um, kind of specialized lumberjack role. They go by a bunch of different names from river rats to river pigs or river dogs. There's a theme there. Also caddy men, which kind of breaks the theme. Um, that basically, these are the guys who are brave or maybe stupid enough to ride these logs down the river over the rapids, over the falls to get to town. And when they get there, hopefully it doesn't look like this. Because eventually, with all of these logs that were you know, meeting at the same place, it could become a bit of a log jam. So. Once they get to town though, they will pull the logs out of the river, probably stack them waiting because the, the sawmills were pretty efficient, but not so efficient that they could cut, you know, all of those down in real time. So they would wait, maybe let them dry out a little bit. And they would cut the logs then down into boards and shingles. The boards then would be combined to make rafts because again, you can't just then take those boards and just ship them down on a flatbed truck because you know, highway system doesn't exist. The railroads don't exist. There's a little dirt road that goes to Stevens Point, but even that you can't get through most of the year because it's, it's, it's not very passable. So you're gonna go down the river. And again, lumbermen will, will get on these rafts and pilot them down the Wisconsin to the Mississippi and there to market. And then when that's done, they would come back up and this, the cycle would start again. And because of this, there is a small little community that emerges. This is the Big Bull Falls, by the way. When we talk about the Big Bull Falls, it's not what it is today, obviously. Just over the years, they did some improvements with dynamite and things like that to make the water flow a little bit better. Um, but yeah, but there's a little community that emerges at the Big Bull Falls. Some of them are there to make money working in the lumber industry. Many of them are here because this is a, this is a community. And there's uh, particularly the, the McIndoo's um, often Walter McIndoo is given the, uh, the honor of being the first citizen of Wassa. I think it's probably fair to lump his, or include his uh, wife Catherine since she was game to come up and make her life here as well. But they, they are among this new group of, of people who are not coming here temporarily, but coming for the long haul. They are going to be living here and this is gonna be a home for them. Um, and eventually we decide we don't want the name Big Bull Falls. In 1850, we get a chance to come up with a new name, and that becomes Wassa, or Wassa, which is the Chippewa, what they would, okay, so here, here I need to set the record straight. I think since the 1870s or 80s, we have been talking about this word as though it is what the Native Americans called the Big Bull Falls. And I gotta tell you, that's not actually likely the case. I, I don't know 100%, obviously, you know, we are a bit removed from that period, but if you actually look at what this word means in the Ojibwe language, it's a locational adverb, meaning far, far away or distant, which would be kind of a weird thing to name a place. You know, you could combine this, and, and there are some stories that use this as combining with other words to create a far away place, and maybe they just shortened it. But, Back in 1855, Hiram Calkins, who was a early lawyer here, he has spent an, a lot of time with the Native Americans. You know, he lo learns the language from the Chippewa. And in 1855, he publishes this uh, nomenclature of the Indians in which he goes and he says, this is what they call places. And here, you can see very clearly that he has said that it's Pajataka Kanegenig. That's what they call Bilka Falls, which translates to the water that falls over the rocks. So, in all likelihood, now it's, it's, you know, certainly there's a lot of different groups. It's possible that they got it from a different place, but 
What we, we can say is that McIndoe, when he's down in the legislature and he has the, uh, the, the honor of naming this new county, he decides to go with Marathon because he likes the Greeks, and he gets to name the new county seat, and they had hit upon this idea of Wassa. We want a Native American word, but they want something, they, they don't want to name it Pajataka Nengening. They want to name it something that is going to be, you know, a little bit more rolling off the tongue for a, an English speaker. And, and Wassa, even though it probably isn't what they actually called the place, it resonated with these residents. Again, there was a dirt road that you could pass part of the year, as far as Stevens Point. Other than that, everything that they needed, all your food, all your clothing, your supplies, your tools, you had to bring up the Wisconsin River over rapids and falls, and it was, a, it was an isolating experience. The only way that you could get mail, word from the outside, is if somebody was coming up the river and said, yeah, I can grab that package, and then they might bring some mail. So there's not regular contact with the outside world. They, for all, for all purposes, are a distant place. They are far away from civilization. So I think ultimately they chose this word intentionally. And later we decided to make it more legitimized by saying the Chippewa called it that, which, you know, who knows? Anyway, that's a story that is often repeated and I figured I might as well set the record straight on that. So what's it like living in Wassa in the 1850s? Well, these guys are a big part of it. So the lumberjacks show up because, okay, well, th they're not here year round. It was a weird place because the population could be two, 300 people, but then during parts of the year, the population could you know, rise to over a thousand because the lumberjacks outfitted from Wassa. We were the highest point you know, to access the pinery. So during parts of the year, they would show up after you know, spending a winter in the woods you know, doing hard labor, and they would come back and they would spend all the cash, their pay that they had in their pocket on uh, whiskey, and they'd visit the Bardellos, which we don't talk about very much for some reason, but they, there was prostitution in Wassa, let me tell you. And then they would get in fights. Um, let me read an account here. Um, this is from uh, D.P. Bentley, I believe, who came here in 1849, and he's talking about what life was like here. Um, oh, that's the wrong account, hold on. Lost track of my note here. There we go. So he said, drinking was fashionable in those days. And when a pair of brawny backwoodsmen had drunk six or eight glasses of raw whiskey, it was not hard to find an excuse for a scrap. Nevertheless, in spite of the frequent quarrels and fights, there were few of the men who would hold a grudge. The winner and loser of the night's battle shook hands. So that kind of gives you an idea. These guys are just bored. They're drunk. Hey, let's just, let's just fight each other. That was, I mean, at this point in the 1850s, you don't even have horse racing to entertain you. Like, there's no baseball team to go cheer on. This was the height of entertainment. Now, of course, as time goes on, there's other people living in Wassa too, particularly, uh, you know, the writer community. And, you know, uh, uh, I'm gonna, here's, here's what I was gonna read. Um, here's an account from, so I'm gonna read a pretty, uh, over this period, there's a great uh, book up that, uh, some manuscript maybe, that Marie Dieter, um, Dieter and Dale Johnson wrote in 1939. They interviewed a lot of people who, you know, the old timers and such. They said that gradually, however, the brawling influence of a purely, purely masculine society was tempered by softer influences, and the social life entered a new phase of barn and tavern dances, around the stove talks in the general store, social whittling on front door stoops, the self-sufficient homespun entertainment of box socials, husking bees, church suppers, and quilting bees, and the sympathetic get-togethers, funerals, marriages, and births. So, you know, every once in a while you get together. It's a hard life still being in Walsa, but every once in a while you have a parade, you have a dance, you get together. Um, in particular, there's a, a fun event that happens in 1853. Um, one of the, they didn't really have a hall yet, but um, I think one of the tavern keepers had a big uh, inauguration ball for uh, President Franklin Pierce's inauguration in 1853. And the account said such that all Wassa attended the festivities. The women decked up in voluminous calico dresses, shawls, and bonnets, or if they had been lucky enough to arrive with their trunks, perhaps a silk hoop skirt and embroidered, embroidered bodice. The men mostly wore overalls, especially washed for the occasion though, colored shirts and high boots. 
The ladies sipped punch and nibbled at ice cakes, while the gentlemen on good behavior kept a beer and homemade wines. And then together they tripped it on the dance floor. The promised band consisting of Mike Rousseau, his unbeatable fiddle, and his resounding voice, which called out the figures of the square dance or the quadrille above the joyous squeak of the strings. And hereafter, dances were frequent occurrences. So, you know, every once in a while, there would be this moment of, hey, let's throw a party, let's get together, let's celebrate the Franklin Pierce's inauguration. And, you know, I think by modern, or even by like the 1870s and 80s, you know, a decade, a generation later, they probably would look back and say, really, that was fun? But hey, that's what they had, and they made the best of it. It's worth noting that by the 1860s, you have the increasing presence of the Germans in the community, as well as other immigrants and other people. It's not quite what it's going to become, but occasionally you would have, you know, for example, they, they started a brass band, so it's a little bit better than Mike Rousseau's fiddle in the 1860s, but also behind them is uh, Coulter's Music Hall, which was, for 25 years, was the center of entertainment and uh, community in Wausau. It's kind of hard to think of one building where everybody would go to, but that's what it was at that period. So, the next kind of big thing that happens is the railroad shows up. Now, in the 1850s, we had been trying to get the railroad here. Throughout the 1860s, we were trying to get the railroad to come here. But financing a railroad is kind of a difficult thing. It was, it was something that could, could go wrong very quickly, um, and it's a lot of money to invest. So they took their time getting up here. But in 1871, we had an agreement with the, Wasa, or, sorry, the Wisconsin Central Line. It was going to come to Wausau, except it didn't because um, the, the farmers of the community decided that they didn't want to pay for Wasa to have a railroad, because why the heck would we need a railroad? They didn't see the point. So um, instead, the Wisconsin Central Line, there, there was a law that said that it had to, uh, any railroad coming to this area had to go to Marathon County. And so they did, technically, they went around the left edge there, just, just through Spencer, maybe about 10 miles. So they dipped back in for Colby. So that's a bit of a disappointment, but the real, the real shame here wasn't so much that the railroad didn't come here, it was, the, the, it was that Stevens Point did get the railroad. They didn't go to us, but they went to Stevens Point. That was the real kicker. So unfortunately, we'll have to do better. So in 1874, we do get the railroad. The Wisconsin Valley Line comes here, and we are connected to the outside world. Not only that, a couple years later in 1880, the Wisconsin Lakeshore and Western arrives. So we have two railroad connections, and Wausau is going to be a thriving uh, place going forward. And this almost immediately completely changes a lot of life in this area. For one thing, the railroad or the, the lumber industry shifts pretty considerably. So now, even though we had for years been floating things down the river, now we don't have to float things down the river anymore. Now we can put them on train cars, which means that it's going to be quicker, and we don't have to worry about them accidentally, you know, running that load of lumber on some rafts, uh, the, the rafts of lumber to, you know, they went over the falls they shouldn't have, and now we lost, you know, all that, all that lumber got damaged. Well, now you put it on a train car, and it's going to get there probably more efficiently. It also means that we don't need to float logs, too. Um, the last raft of lumber leaves Wausau in 1883. They're going to be um, still bringing lumber to Wausau on the Wisconsin into the 19-teens, but it's going to be much smaller scale. And instead, they're going to be putting it on train cars. The other advantage to this, of course, is that you don't just have to go with white pine anymore, because now you can put everything on there. You're not worrying about whether it's going to sink in the water or not. You can, you can put loads and loads of hemlock and maple and all of that stuff. And then the mills would just take, take, take it over. So the Mortensen Mill, for example, they, they do a lot of hemlock. Um, the Barker Stewart Island Mill, they are really, that's their bread and butter. It's, it's, it's hemlock. Um, and so we enter this new era of lumbering in which the, the amount of logs that are leave, you know, coming into Wasson, the board feet of lumber that's leaving is, is going up quite a bit. Of course, the downside to this is that, well, I mean, it's good and bad. Now that you can just put a jut of the railroad into an area, they don't just cut down selected trees. They're clear cutting everything, acre after acre. Anything that would be cut down into a board, we're going we're gonna to put that on a train and send it to the mill. So that's great because the, the, the uh, output of the lumber industry is increasing, but people are starting to get concerned that maybe this so-called inexhaustible resource might sometime disappear. In, in Wausau, we kind of just ignore that for about 20 years. That's the future to deal with. And eventually, the Wausau group is going to show up and famously put us back on the right course. 
Um, these are a group of businessmen who show up and they, uh, well not show up, they live here. Um, they are involved in lumber and, and other interests and they decide, you know, 1901, let's sit down and figure out what we're going to do. Lumber is probably going to be dried up in Wisconsin for, you know, 10, 15 years. So let's pivot to other industries. Let's build some paper companies. Let's build some motor companies, some manufacturing. Um, let's get involved in insurance and, and utilities. And, and ultimately, sometimes we think of these guys as being the, the ushering in a new generation and you know the start of the 20th century. But it's also probably fair to think of them as the ending point. They are the, the, you know, the people from the 1800s. This, these are the guys who ran WASA. And even though they stick around like DC Everest and Mark Ewing and people like that, they stuck around for many years and were involved. This style of just, well, we're gonna get a bunch of our friends together and make it happen. Um, it's kind of the last gasp of that, of the lumbering. And there's gonna be kind of a new philosophy in the 20th century. We'll pick up on that in a bit. But first let's talk about how the railroad impacts the rest of Wausau. So for one thing, these guys, the lumbermen, they are not equipping from Wausau anymore because now the railroad can go up even further. So now they're leaving from Rhinelander or Tomahawk or you know, places like that. So they're not you know, fighting in the streets of Wausau anymore. So I don't know, we become respectable almost. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, they talked about you know, back in the day when the lumbermen were there, you know, bar owners urgently wished for the opportunity to have crystal chandeliers and mahogany bars. But it's just like, well, that's never gonna happen because you know, that's just gonna get broken. Uh, but now they can. Right? We have other nice things. And, and part of this is also, even though the lumbermen aren't here, the railroad brings in a lot of new people. And you can see the population go from about 500 people in 1860 in the city of Wausau, more than doubling to 1870, and then more than doubling again to 1880, and then more than doubling, well, about doubling uh, to 1890. And then for the first time from 1890 to, to the new century, um, we, we don't double, but it's almost there. So that exponential growth almost uh, for the city of Wassa, that's, that's due to all of this influx of people. Uh, the immigrant population, the Germans, the Norwegians, the Swedish, the Polish, as well as just every people from every walk of life. So how are we respectable? Well, now we have schools, right? We had schools since the 1860, but you know, in the 1860, it was, it was basically, um, there was a, um, a class of about half a dozen people that they might move around. It might be in you know, someone's home one week and then next year it's gonna be you know, in the, in the back of the, the, the tailor's shop. Uh, but in the 1870s, we started building some buildings and the, the population grows so that, you know, we have schools. In 1881, they reorganized the district to make it more efficient to, you know, at all of that. And they announced that they had perfected the graded school. So there's good news there. Churches, another indication of this. Again, there had been people who were, you know, practicing. There had been congregations. There'd been people who were getting around and, um, you know, prayer groups, and maybe you might get a preacher that comes by in the 1850s and, you know, itinerant preachers and things like that. Uh, by the 1880s, though, you can see this is the city directory lists seven different, uh, you know, buildings for, for, for worship. Um, and I've, there's a few of these that probably could fit in here, too. I'm not sure how they chose the seven, but it's a good cross-section. We've got a lot of different, con you know, different uh, Christian beliefs within that. But just the census, if we just use their, or not census, the directory, in a decade, there will be 18. So, and you can see here that, that difference. Now we not only have a, a Catholic church, we also have a Polish Catholic church. We don't just have the Lutheran church, we have an Emmanuel Luther, Norwegian Lutheran church and the Swedish Lutheran church. We've got German Methodists, German Reformed. So there's not only this wider, you know, cross-section of the population in terms of the beliefs, but we have that division. And that speaks to one of the things that they talked about during this period. You know, the railroad accelerates and, and the, the growth of people is great. You know, now there's a, you know, um, you know, for example, I guess I was gonna talk about it here. Let's talk about it here. Meeting places. As I said, back in the 1870s, there was one building, it was Music Hall. If you wanted to have a dance or a get together, it was there. No other options. Well, I guess you could also go to the park. There was a park down in Grand Avenue near the breweries that people would go to sometimes, but by the 1880s, that was more for the working class Germans. You know, everybody else wouldn't necessarily go there. By 1884, there are five different venues for meetings, halls, and by 1891, there's a, a great deal more. And again, you can see that, that sort of specialization. And one thing this is good about is if you're a German, right, come to the city, if you speak German and that's kind of your background, you can go to the Arbeiter Hall, the Deutscher Arbeiter und Verein, or the DAUV, the working, working 
German Men's Association. Um, and you can, you can find your people. You know, you can, you can hey, come on, well, here's, here's, sit down at the meal or that sort of thing. Um, but you probably would not have been welcome at the opera house for the, you know, the, uh, the Yankee women who were getting together to study, you know, the, the Ladies' Aid Society fundraiser. Like, there's this stratification. Classism exists because now it's, you know, in the early days, it was everybody was in this together, so we're all, everybody's welcome as long as you don't put up a, a struggle. By the 1870s and 80s, we start to see, well, now, now we will judge you if you're German-speaking or Polish-speaking or whether you go to this church or that church. It's not you know, a big problem, but it, this is when this starts to end up happening, just to show that change. And this is what it means to be alive with the bustle of the world, right? It's a microcosm of the wider world. There is differences of opinion about whether people like the German-speaking or the Polish-speaking or you're Catholic or you're Lutheran. These are all things that now we have to contend with. Being alive with the bustle of the world means that we get all of those you know, nice acts coming up by the railroad, and that's great. You know, we get entertainment, we get new stuff coming in, but it also means that we have to be aware of the, you know, the stuff going on. So let's take stock. If we're, we're going into the new century, we're still a typical lumbering town, right? Clearly, the, the lumbering, who knows for how much longer we can be lumbering, but we are lumbering by the end of the decade, and, and very much so. We're, we're one of the centers of that trade. We are alive with the bustle of the world, good and bad. And also, I think that there is a very real sense of being conscious of a brilliant future. We're looking into this new century with optimism, um, especially after the Wasa Group kind of helped correct us um, so that we're not reliant on the lumber industry. But if there was one group that was really into being conscious of a brilliant future, it was the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm starting with the proto groups because it, in the early years, there was like the Advancement Society, there was the uh, West Side Businessmen Association. <clears throat> so we had different groups that were, were functioning essentially. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things they do is they choose a slogan in the early 19 teens. They say, hey, we, we want to market WASA. So let's come up with a slogan. And so they have a competition and the winner is work for WASA. And they're so happy about that, they put it on top of City Hall, big old sign, lights, so it would shine out to the people to say, work for WASA. And, and the whole purpose here was, let's have a button made up so that when you, you know, wear that button when you're traveling so that people will ask you about it. Let's get the word out there. We're gonna take this picture of the, the sign on the, and make postcards out of it. We're gonna send those out there because that's how we get, you know, it's kind of early advertising. They don't quite understand what a brand, but they know a brand is important. So the idea is, hey, if people know us, if they recognize the name WASA because of our slogan, because of our sign, well, maybe they'll want to move their business here. Maybe they'll want to start, you know, move their family here. It's also, it's okay, so it's not very effective in that regard necessarily, but it is also effective. It's not so much about getting the people outside. It's about getting people involved. This is something that you don't have to be Cyrus Yaki to do. Everybody, if you're traveling, you know, here's a button. Go out there and repeat the phrase. It doesn't really mean anything. It, there's no deeper meaning behind work for WASA. It's just, it has a nice alliteration and it has something you can say, but this is a way that we can get the wider public involved. And that's kind of, when I, when I talked about the, the WASA group and being kind of the end of the 1800s, that's kind of what I mean. There are still gonna be people who are gonna be very important in, in politics and the civic life and business. We're going to be in, you know, uh, influential in moving WASA in new directions in the new century. But it's also, hey, we are all part of this community. And the Chamber of Commerce, which gets formed in 1916, um, they kind of struggled to figure out what they should be doing at first. But in 1921, they sit down and they ask all of their, re uh, their members. There's about 800 people who are members of the Chamber of Commerce. And they send out a letter saying, what do you think that we should be doing to help you? Um, I have the responses, some of the responses here. Um, and it's interesting to look, and, and I want to just take a moment to talk about, this is about a century ago, right? What is Wassa like in 1922? So through these responses, I mean, some of them are kind of what you might expect. They want the Chamber of Commerce to continue to attract industrial concerns. Let's bring new industries here. Let's support those industries. Let's continue to support local businesses by getting people to buy local and things like that. But they also say things like, we, ought, we need a new modern office building. That would be great. That would help to keep people here. Uh, let's get a modern hotel or two, uh, because we don't really have hotels in what we would consider today as a hotel, you know? 
Um, that also kind of goes along hand in hand with the promotion of tourism. You know, now suddenly in the 1920s, people got these automobiles and they're touring around the country. And let's make Wassa a place that we want them to stay. Along with that, maybe we could maintain the roads a little bit better because it's kind of embarrassing if the roads are bad. So we want to make sure that the inside and to Wassa, you know, people have a nice smooth ride. And then there's some interesting ones like, you know, if you think about World War I, it's over. Now everybody's kind of getting back to work. People, the city of Wassa is still growing pretty considerably. We hadn't built enough houses. So they're saying, let's address the lack of residential housing for the working class, because we, if we're gonna have businesses move here, we wanna make sure that there are people that can live here. And then the one that I didn't expect, which kind of makes sense though, is apparently we, were, we had a reputation of having horrible water. The drinking water in the city of Wassa in 1922 was, I mean, it wouldn't kill you. It's probably sanitary, but it didn't taste good. And apparently, I mean, nobody had thought about it for years. We had just been dumping the chemicals from the paper companies and the, um, you know, the lumber companies. Like, maybe we should worry about that. Let's try to improve the water quality in Wassa. Beyond that, I think that we can expand. They didn't really talk about it here, but there are things like, again, World War I had just ended up, and now there's this question of like, okay, what politically are we gonna be here? Because the socialists, believe it or not, had a lot of success during World War I. Uh, so do we have to worry about the socialists coming back? You know, the reason being that all the Germans, right, all the Germans in town who suddenly were now the enemy, and you can't speak your language or be happy about where you come from, they are suddenly being attacked, and the socialists are the only political party saying we shouldn't be in this war. So they get a lot of protest votes, and you know, after the war, okay, the socialists are not getting the protest votes, they get you know, pushed out. But there's this question of like, okay, do we like La Follette and his kind of progressive republicanism? Do we want to go a different direction? You know, what's that going to look like? Also, women are voting now. So what does that mean? Because, you know, now that they have the votes, does that mean that the people in charge have to list, do they have things they want? We, we don't really know that yet. And women are out in the public. They're working, they are, you know, literally walking around in public, which is something that 50 years earlier probably, you probably wouldn't have seen. Again, the Germans not so happy. What, what's the deal there? Are we going to just like go back to normal? Can we be German? All of the new, you know, for example, the newspapers, we had a number of German language newspapers here. We went from like three down to one, and that one only lasts for about five or six more years before it disappears. So the German institutions are kind of disappearing, and that's, that's a going concern. There's also, I mean, just to kind of bring it back to what's happening uh, today in some ways, um, Spanish flu happened, this influenza pandemic, and we hit Wasa very hard. And even though we had gotten out of that, the flu was kind of run its course in Wasa. In 1922, they're going, well, maybe St. Mary's, we need more beds in case something like this happens again. Let's make another expansion. And maybe we should have a Southern hospital. So they start thinking about Memorial Hospital. So it's changing the way that, that legacy as well. And then in general, you just have things like Technology seems to be rapidly changing the world around us. This is a photograph taken from an airplane. That's crazy to them in 1922. This is something that you would never have seen before. This, this is maybe the first aerials ever taken of Wassa from an airplane. And that's concerning. Oh, I mean, not concerning, it's exciting, but also what does that mean? What is the radio that's becoming popular? There's new forms of music, like this jazz music that these kids are liking. Like, what does that mean for the future? automobiles that seems to be changing things. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the 1920s. And the reason that I kind of want to talk about this is because in putting this program together, trying to sum up 150 years plus years of history, it's kind of hard to just be like, here it is in an hour. Uh, at any point, you could take a year and, and do this same thing. And there's a lot of concerns and, and complicated things, but you, know, you don't always get a chance to, to dig into that. But I figured it was, might be worth it here for the moment. Let's move on. So I mentioned the Chamber of Commerce, right? They um, put together in 1939 um, a booklet here. It's a, it's a basically a something they were going to send out. Say, here's why you should come to Wassa as, a, as an individual, as a family, as a as an industry. Um, and you can see the cover there. What they're promoting? Not only industry, but we got recreation, good fishing here. Um, these are the things that they say we have going for us, right? And I'm just going to read the ending here. Ooh, um, they have a conclusion, and the conclusion is this. Today, no, let's see here. 
It is, the spirit, it is in a spirit of confidence with respect to Wasa's future, as well as its pride in its past achievements that the facts of this industrial survey are presented for your consideration. Um, yeah. So they have, I mean, granted, the Chamber of Commerce needs to put, they're not going to say like, I don't know, we're not sure about the future here. They have to be, you know, put on a pleasant face. But I think that they do genuinely feel, and these are all real things. These are, these are things Wasa has going for it. We are connected to the railroads, the highways, we've got an airport, good transportation, we've got good parks and schools going for us, there's recreation, and we do have this growth of the industry. So they are, the Chamber of Commerce and groups like that are doing this sort of thing. They're also, you know, putting on events, events that are going to get tourism. The Winter Well, Winter well <clears throat> the Wassa Winter Frolic in the 1920s. This is, a, this is a big thing about promoting winter tourism. Um, you have events like the homecoming. You know, here's the Chamber of Commerce's float there. This is a whole attempt in 1932 to get people to come back to Wassa and, you know, have, have, celebrate that. You know, dairy, dairy month, you know, June dairy month. Here's the dairy breakfast in 1955. Um, so so it's, it's not just promoting businesses. It's not just promoting the industries moving here or staying here. It's also about making the people who live here, the life that they have, better. Um, but I do want to go back to this for a second, because you might have noticed the asterisk on industrial sites. One of the problems that they had is by the end of the 1940s, they were or actually mid 40s, they realized that Wasa was running out of great places for industry to grow. Um, you really want an industry to be able to you know, expand. They shouldn't just have to, like for example, um, Wasa Metals is in the 1950s get started, right? And they're making these aluminum windows. We don't want them to not be able to expand and then to say, okay, well, we can't continue to grow, so we're going to move to Medford, or we're going to go somewhere else. We want them to stay here. And we also want when, for example, when, again, continuing Wassa Metals, when they get bought by this um, uh, Minnesota company, Apogee, Apogee has the opportunity to move it away, but they continue to invest in Wassa because of the Wassa West Industrial Park, because we have the room. And that's kind of what ends up happening here. If there's room for companies and the, the uh, if, if they feel like there's going to be a future that they can continue to expand and to grow, and you know, all of these other things are going to stay consistent, that's going to be important. And the first one of these is, interestingly, actually the Schofield Industrial Park, or area, as they called it. Um, the Chamber of Commerce of Wassa actually buys up the old Drott, or not, sorry, uh, the Brooks and Ross uh, mill, um, which had been defunct by this point. The paper com or, uh, lumber companies were kind of um, uh, gone away by this point. Um, but they buy it up and they turn it into an area. And even though it wasn't in the city of Wassa, for, you know, the, the feeling was, hey, if Schofield grows, it's only going to help Wassa. If our neighbor, you know, it's not a competition between Wassa and Schofield and Rothschild. If, if they grow, we grow. Um, and it'd be nice to be able to annex that land and add the tax dollars for the Drott company when they move there. That's kind of the first big one, when Ed Drott moves his manufacturing company to this area. But ultimately, you know, the people who are going to work for Drott and his factory, are many of them maybe live in Wassa. And they're probably going to do their shopping in downtown Wassa, because that's where the department stores are. And that's where all of that is happening. Um, and yeah, so this, this works out great for Schofield. It, it is a little unfortunate that we can't annex it from the city of Wasa's point of view, but we will move westward because we can annex the, I mean, there's no village of Statine. It's, it's the town of Statine. And so as we, this is looking west or east towards, um, you know, along Stewart Avenue and Marathon Park on the right side there. Um, in the 18, in 1950s and 60s, we steadily move away from um, the river towards the west side. And there's other reasons for this, of course, too. Um, partially, this is kind of indicative of car culture, right? Now, everybody after World War II, you know, this is, everybody has a car. So that freedom to go wherever you want means that you don't have to be within walking distance of, you know, the, the department stores downtown. And so as we can kind of spread out, you know, we're, we're going to go where we can go. It's hard to kind of expand too much to the east because of the hills and the sort of geography over there. We can't really go south too much because of the, uh, you know, Schofield and Rothschild are down there in the east, and on the west there's the river, and the Rib Mountain kind of creates problems. But west we can go, and we do. And this ultimately leads to the, you know, department stores and stuff, we're still going to need to go to Wassa, but, you know, things like parks and, you know, schools, uh, we want to have those nearby the residential areas. So this is interesting because, again, they built this here kind of envisioning that, and if you look at the, the area now, there's still a lot of residential area that's left to be built. Um, so that's kind of, you know, 
looking forward to that. So Wasa West High School, uh, back in the 60s, they had looked at the situation and realized that the, the high school in Wasa was not going to be big enough. And so there were surveys that said, hey, we should expand this, uh, you know, buy up some of the surrounding blocks. But instead, they decide because of the shifting population, because the, the, you know, the geographic center of Wasa was shifting west with all of these new uh, neighborhoods, let's build a new school. Okay, we got to talk about traffic too, because one of the downsides here is that if everybody's driving around and we have all of these places, um, we, it also exacerbates the problem that the downtown area was never really intended to have parking, for example. And um, for this, we're going to look at, that's right, I know you're excited for this, the comprehensive plan for the Wasa area of Wisconsin. Oh, whoops. Um, 125 pages of in-depth discussion about where traffic is and uh, whether the parks are sufficient for the neighborhoods. It was a, it was a long process that they created this, um, and it becomes the basis for a bunch of different policies that end up coming out of this. Um, and, and they have a big section here about traffic. And they have all these sort of diagrams showing here's where people are and here's what the... Unfortunately, they only had the one color, um, so it's kind of hard to tell what's supposed to be what on the left there, but I guess that's what they had to go with. Um, there's a couple things that they look at, and they look at the downtown area, and they say, um, maybe we should have some, some one-ways. Let's get a circular system, because the problem is we don't want cross-traffic, because that's going to create problems. As people are driving around block to block looking for parking, you know, that's not very good for the pedestrians trying to do their shopping. So uh, this is kind of when they start to add all of those one-ways that we love in the city of Wausau. Um, and uh, yeah. But, I mean, the downtown area, ultimately, in the 1970s, I think the, the, the thing that comes up is the question, of should we have a mall? And this is kind of interesting, because this is from 1971, asking, are malls the answer? What they're talking about here is not the mall as it becomes, but the mall as they thought it might be, which is more of a pedestrian, like in the old sense, a walking mall. They were just thinking, maybe we should just block off the traffic. But I think in this article, they talked about how some, maybe La Crosse had started that, and they realized, you know, people just didn't feel comfortable because there were no traffic. It didn't feel like the area was alive. So they end up going a different direction, obviously. Um, a shopping mall, which is a very 1980s approach to the 1980s problems, right? Um, and then this is very successful. Obviously, in 1977, they start to uh, go forward with the plans to figure out what it's going to look like and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, in 1983, we have the opening of the mall. And it is very successful. It is very successful. It keeps the, 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 the commerce here. Um, you know, we got, we got parking. We've got, um, it, it, it also spurs other development of other downtown area developments to make, uh, you know, to rejuvenate the area and make it, uh, you know, better. You know, obviously, we know the, the elephant in the room here being that it's not there anymore. And obviously, it's not going to be a long, long, long-term solution. But that's kind of the nature of everything. And for the 80s and 90s and into the 20th, 21st century, it still was you know, uh, a really, real big asset. Um, so that's exciting. 1983 was an exciting year. Um, but let's, let's, take a, let's stop here before we, we continue on and, and take stock here. Are we still a typical lumbering town? Not, not really, right? Um, we, we have some companies that are making things out of wood, like Colby & Colby is still doing that, for example, but they're even moving into like plastics and stuff like that by the end of the century. Um, we are a typical town in a lot of ways. You know, we've got a mall, we've got the modern issues and th that many cities in the United States have, but maybe not so much a lumber town anymore. The, there is some heritage, you know, there's the legacy, the fact that the, you know, our baseball team for many years is the Lumberjacks and even the Woodchucks kind of a nod to that. You know, the, the fact that the East and West football teams, when they play each other, they, they, the trophy is a log. You know, that's not just because somebody had a chunk of wood laying around, it's a nod to the history of the community, but yeah. Probably not a lumber town. Uh, we are live with the bustle of the world, right? I think that's fair to say too. Uh, modern problems, and you know, we're we're part of that solution. We're connected to the wider world through all these things, and we are conscious of a brilliant future. I think 1983, we definitely were. Not only did we have the opening of the mall and the big celebrations around that, but also we were made the All America City. We got the award. Um, had applied for this, this award, um, and we became a finalist. And in 1983, we sent a, a, a group of people over uh, to Baltimore to make the case in person. And they say that, look, there's, there's the three things that they, they say uh, we should consider as being important to why we are all-American city is, well, there was a task force that they had created where, um, 
where the you know the city, the government, the business people had um, kind of looked at the funding in the future. Kind of boring in that regard from from the posterity, but very important for that time period. Um, they talked about the uh, whitewater rafting course and how that was sort of rejuvenating this thing, which is which is also a really good example of of kind of going back to the past. I mean, the river and the rapids is why we exist, and so to find this new way to reinterpret that for the future is a big success. Um, and then, of course, the Hmong. Um, so we, you know, one, some of the Hmong go along to Baltimore, and they they make the case that like, hey, we fled our country um, under some very difficult situations, ended up in refugee camps, but now we're here in Wassa, and we have a future, and we're being welcomed by most of the city. I mean, there's still some skepticism by some people, but, you know, here we are. And, and this is also, again, talk about being alive with the bustle of the world. You know, we accepted refugees that, you know, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any, any say in them being displaced from, from Laos, but we gave them a home and were part of the solution. So that's a great example. So, yeah. And these two things, the rejuvenation of the downtown area and probably more considerably the arrival of the Hmong actually kind of, I mean, the population of Wassa actually kind of declines a little bit between 1970 and 80 which arguably might be due to the rise of communities like Rim Mountain and Weston and other residential areas in the you know, suburbs. But um, there's a big jump, and we're, we continue to grow after that. Um, and again, largely because of we're put on the right track. So you know, if population, and granted, that's not a super great representation of how people feel about the community. But the, growing, the fact that we're still growing, I think, indicates the fact that you know, there's, there's some enthusiasm. Now, we do have to recognize that there isn't, you know, that same issue where they proudly show the, the Hmong marching in the street in costumes as part of the parade. They also have a page dedicated to the question of, you know, there's some racism towards the Hmong. Not everybody wants them to be here. And, and hopefully we're at a place now and, you know, these years later where that's not as prevalent, but it is still here. It is still a thing that we have to deal with. You know, the mall was a big success in the 1980s, but obviously that's a big question mark of how we go forward into the future. Um, it's not here anymore. And it's not because, you know, the people of Wa the Wassa area didn't buy enough from Radio Shack um, or, or Sears. It's, it's part of a larger problem. Again, being alive with the bustle of the world is, a, you know, it cuts both ways. It's great because you can grow and you can be part of the excitement of the world. But sometimes the Great Depression hits in the 1930s and we have to make some, you know, deals with that. Or, you know, the internet shows up. And this is where I get into the question of I don't really know how to explain what's been going on now. Um, the last 25 years, there are things that I think that are important going forward, but even summing up the last 25 years, I mean, how do you explain the importance of the internet when we are still very much dealing with the ramifications that it brings? Um, I don't really know what to say about that. There are things that you could say about it, but, uh, or about the, the downtown area. It'd be weird to talk about the mall when the story of the legacy of the mall is still being written as we go on. Hopefully in 50 years, looking back, when they do the bicentennial of the history of Wassa, hopefully somebody standing here or wherever they're going to be are going to be uh, able to tell us, hey, 50 years ago, this is how they got through the, the, the 2020s. I don't have the ability to say that. Uh, I, I also have a great deal of respect and, and sympathy for whoever has to sum up 200 years. It is really hard to do 150 in an hour. Um, but for the time being, we're just going to have to make do with what we have. Um, we are celebrating, you know, a brilliant future. Uh, we are celebrating 150 years this year. This is, you know, we have a whole big celebration down at Marathon Park next, at next week, actually. If you're looking for something to do, it should be a good time. It's a big celebration for the 150 years of the city of Wassa. And, and one of the things that often comes about when you have a celebration like this is it's an opportunity to reflect upon where we come from and what the future might hold. You know, it's what they did back in the 70s for the, for the, for the uh, 100th anniversary. It's what they did in 1922. It's varying extents. So the thing that I'm going to end on here before we get to questions and everything else is I would like to invite you to take part in an attempt that we are going to do to try and document the community as it is. Um, there is surveys, in addition to our regular surveys, that, you know, how, how would you enjoy this program and what could we be doing better? What people would you like to hear talk or subjects in the future? We also have some surveys that are a quick anonymous survey. It's, it's three, four questions, just, hey, what, what do you think has been important in the last 20, 25 years? 
what are you excited about in the future and what are you concerned about? And, and what we're going to do with those is we're going to collect the results, uh, you know, whatever we get, and we will be documenting that for posterity. So that again, in 50 years, when they're looking back, they can go, well, here's what people were interested, excited, or concerned about. Um, you know, seems like it's a good opportunity to do that. So if you're interested in doing that, there are physical surveys here. If you're watching this um, on the, the digital programming, um, there's a link to a survey that you can fill out. Um, again, anonymous, um, and we'll have them, I think we'll have them as well at, at future events over the course of the, the next few months. So I think at this point, um, I'm going to stop talking and allow you, if any questions exist, um, we're going to have a microphone. So if you wouldn't mind uh, just waiting for the microphone to come so that everybody can hear the question, if there are any questions. But uh, yeah. Anybody have any questions? I'm just going to check to see if there are any internet questions, because who knows? But feel free if anything comes to mind. Well, just a very simple question. Did, they, did men, people, have to like paddle up the thing before the railroad? Did, when they wanted to bring those rafts back up, did they have to paddle them up? Yes, um, to the extent that they could. Um, obviously, you know, places like the Little Bull Falls down in Mosinee, that was notorious for being really dangerous. So you probably wouldn't try to go up the falls. So in, that, in those cases, at, at points like that, what they would do is they would take the boat out of the water, unload their supplies, carry it up so where the water returned to being kind of normal, and then put back in and continue on their way. Which is also one of the reasons that it was very monotonous as a process, because it's not just going up the river, it means going bits at a time, and having to be very careful, otherwise you might, you know, capsize the boat and lose all the stuff you brought with you. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just curious, what is that picture from? And yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting picture. It is, I believe, a parade. It's either a parade or the response. So what this is, you can see the, the guy saying History Speaks is actually on a horse-drawn carriage, uh, which is the fire engine. So I think this, I don't know if this is in a parade, but I think this also might have been, no, this is a parade. But this is the fire department being involved um, and, and sort of people seeing the new shiny engine that they had. Um, I was gonna look into this to have more information at my fingertips in case this came up and I forgot. Uh, but I believe this is like from the 19 teens or 20s, te probably 19 teens. Um, yeah, the, the fire department did some expansion during this period. So uh, a long way from the, you know, a handful of people with buckets volunteering, they, they have some equipment and all of that. And uh, they, you know, if you're going to put all that money into a shiny new fire engine, uh, you know, pump, you might as well bring it out and let people see it on the parade. Right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, yeah. Thanks for coming. I hope you, you learned something. Um, yeah. All right. Cool. And, uh, and thanks for watching. <laughs>